we knew half these people from Cog Life. Yes, yeah, yeah Fred Jr. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being available yeah, for this. Of course, yeah. yeah. Elise, I went, I think she was in my one year ahead of me in the play. Different last name, but I think she was one year. I wish, I, you know, there's a bus. I live just north of, I just, I have to pick out my son after work. And I would have to leave at like 4 or 5 in time. But maybe that'll become a little more flexible when you get like really, really the best part. I don't think my husband can do this. I was also in the morning. I want to play Harbor about seven. My England year. Someday. Mm hmm. I love just north. Trinity. How are things from here in Indiana? Between downtown and Indiana. It's exciting. Yeah. So I'll just play my son's name next to it. I think it probably says how much it is in the fact that I run on the last week. Good evening. I call to order the meeting of the Planning Commission, Durham Planning Commission, May the 13th, 2014, uh, at 5.31 o'clock. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. The members of the Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final say on any issue before us tonight. If you wish to speak on the agenda item tonight, please go to the table to my left and sign up to speak. For those who wish to speak, please state your name and your address clearly when you come to the podium. And please speak directly into the mic very clearly. Each side, those speaking in favor of an item and those speaking in opposition to an item will have 10 minutes to present for each side. The time will be divided among all persons wishing to speak. If you are here opposing a rezoning tonight, you should be aware of what is called a protest petition. A protest petition can be very helpful to those residents who live in the rezoning area. Please consult the planning department staff for any details on a protest petition and they will be happy and able to help you. You should also keep in constant touch with the planning, planning department 
as to when your case will go before the elected officials for final vote. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you. Can we now have the roll call, please? Commissioner Board. Commissioner Davis. Present. Commissioner Gibbs. Present. Commissioner Huff. Commissioner Miller. Present. Commissioner Padgett. Present. Commissioner Walters. Here. Commissioner Whitley. Present. Commissioner Winders. And for the minutes, I am acting as chair today as the chairman Jones is not present with us tonight. So I'm assuming that role. Uh, are there any adjustments to the agenda tonight? To the agenda? Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, in the announcement section. Speak, would you speak in the mic? Mr. Chairman, in the uh, announcement section, I'd like to take a moment or two of the Commission's time to talk about uh, possible legislation in this session of the General Assembly. Okay. Are there any other adjustments? Good evening, Commissioners. Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, no adjustments to the agenda. I can uh, certify for the record that all public hearing items before you tonight have been uh, advertised in accordance with the provisions of law, and we have affidavits to that effect on file with the Planning Department. Uh, and I, I will mention, for the record, um, Commissioner Beelan did ask for an excused absence, and um, Commissioner um, Lamb uh, resigned due to an employment opportunity in Atlanta, Georgia. So uh, the city clerk's office is aware of that, and just, that's just information for the commission. Who, who resigned? Uh, Commissioner Lamb. The, the oh, Chair okay. Jones was aware okay. of that. I, I, was, I wasn't sure if you all were included on that communication. Okay. Um, the, uh, he has an employment opportunity in, in, in Georgia. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So I trust each of you had an opportunity to look at the minutes from our last meeting. So what's your pleasure? Mr. Chairman, uh, I have one little adjustment I'd like to make. It's really a clerical thing. In connection with the comments, uh, reported comments under case Z14, uh, quadruple R3. Uh, my comments recurring, concerning the downtown open space plan got stuck there instead of the downtown open space. No. Oh. It should be not. Huh. So, okay, I'm sorry, I'm going back. Uh, so, in that, it's in that. Uh, pardon me. Oh. That uh, Mr. Chairman, with regard to the uh, comments, Commissioner's comments in case Z14-3, uh, my comments concerning the downtown open space plan uh, are stuck there in the minutes instead of in the downtown open space plan section. So I have comments concerning that case, but they're only th uh, two and a half lines. And then it says concerning the downtown open space plan, that should be over on the next page. Other than that, that's all I have. Okay, with that correction, can I get a motion for approval? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. It's moved by Commissioner Miller, second by Commissioner Whitley. All in favor of approving the uh, minutes with the necessary correction from last meeting, let it be known by raised right hand. Minutes has passed 10 to zero. Okay, no opposition. Okay, item number five on the agenda is the public hearing, Unified Development Ordinance Tax Amendment TC 1300001, technical change number eight. Uh, thank you very much, Michael Sock with the Planning Department. Uh, TC 13001 is a uh, text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance. It is a collection of technical and minor policy changes to that ordinance. It is grouped into three categories, uh, at least for, 
for this round. Um, amendments that are necessary to comply to state or federal regulations, amendments identified as necessary corrections, clarifications, or reorganizations, or other minor changes uh, to more accurately comply with the intent of the initial regulations or actually codify interpretations. Uh, of those regulations. And then also, uh, finally, uh, additional corrections or clarifications based upon um, a review of the current standards through changes to the discretionary regulations that this board reviewed, oh, I guess, uh, less than a year ago. And that was uh, approved by uh, City Council and uh, the Board of Commissioners. Uh, we go through this process generally once a year or so. We're now at one and a half. Uh, years and um, this is I believe uh, it's a text amendment eight so this is the eighth time we've we've gone through this process also at your chair um, I placed a memo with three just additional minor revisions that I wanted included uh, within your review um, is just clarification to changes that are already within the packet um, if you'd like I can go through some of the changes with you or if you just have specific questions I can answer them I know it is a lengthy uh, document, so I don't want to belabor any points. Um, the memo tried to summarize uh, what was uh, being changed. Um, I can highlight some of the more lar uh, more extensive changes. Um, one of the things that we are doing is reorganizing the UDO to, uh, as you'll see, a lot of the special use permit processes are being consolidated into one article, so you're seeing a lot of cross-out and underlining uh, for that. Uh, we are adding in a provision that allows if a development plan is a more detailed development plan in terms of the use that's being proposed and it would normally need a minor special use permit, it is allowing that if, if the use is detailed and there's also more specifics within that development plan pertaining to that use, they wouldn't need a use permit. They're going through the public hearing process right now, going through this board, getting elected official approvals. Um, we've seen that, and that's already a process that's allowed within the UDO through a development plan site plan approval, which this board has seen maybe two or three times already. Um, we saw that as, an, as a worthwhile uh, change to uh, re reduce redundancies, um, but also still provide um, substantial public input. Uh, also, um, there are substantial changes, well not substantial changes, but a um, number of changes to uh, the design district standards. Most of them is really uh, substantially reorganizing some of the text. Um, getting it out of paragraph form and into more bullet point or enumerated form. Uh, and I'm trying to think of any other significant things, uh, items within there that I would want to bring your attention to. Uh, again, I'll be happy to answer any questions as, uh, as you see fit. Thank you. Uh, I have no one signed up for public, but are there anyone in the audience that wish to speak to this item? If not, I close the public hearings and bring it back before the commissioners. Do I have commissioners that wish to speak? Okay. All right, wait a minute. Whitley, Winders, Tom. Okay, board. And, okay. And Linda Huff? Okay. Okay, Mr. Whitley, uh, Commissioner Whitley. I have often, and I, I just need to, to know how this um, amendment would affect um, developers that want to use um, land retention measures to, um, to, save, um, to save land in swamp, swamp land. Um, South Carolina has done a lot of it where they put ponds, they develop ponds in swamp land and, and it keeps, the, the water stays there but it's, it's a deeper, they, they dredge the, the, the swamp so it makes it deeper and they retain the land. Um, the runoff runs into the pond and um, doesn't set on the land. Now, if a developer want to come to Durham to do that, would this text change get in the way? 
No, it wouldn't. Uh, this be text before you start, Commissioner Smusky, would you please join us? And secondly, would you guys fix, fix the clock to give each commissioner three minutes of speaking time? Thank you. All right, sir. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. Um, it's not impacting any of the current wetlands or stream buffer regulations that are currently within the UDO, and most of those regulations are actually more extensive than state, state minimum requirements. Thank you. Commissioner Winders. I, there, there are two sections in here that I would like for you to just kind of explain and comment on some I, I, uh, to uh, let me know what's, what's going on in them. Um, and um, one is a, the uh, residential density under mixed use. And um, at, was that in the old UDO at all? all? Can you give me the page Excuse number? Me. Can you give us a page? Oh, yes, 37. I see it's gone from like 80% of the maximum density permitted within the development tier and, and uh, to a definite number or something. And, and that's exactly what it is. It's just giving you a number based upon what those percentages would actually work out yeah, to be. It sounds really, really high, 53 uh, units in a per well, maximum density. Again, that's right. the current regulations. We're just putting it in a numeric tabular form instead of in a paragraph format. Yeah. yeah. Okay, would the timekeeper stop the time when they're answering the question? Okay. And, and we, they restart it when they start? I, I know we are doing these uh, plans for the, uh, the uh, com compact, for the station areas, you know, the compact neighborhoods. Uh, will that be, is there just one, would all these rules apply to those station areas, station um, areas when these, those plans get done? All these rules within this entire text amendment or within the design district? Uh, within the, uh, the design district, the compact neighborhood design district. Well, currently um, the design districts are only applicable to downtown, their zone downtown design district and the 9th Street uh, compact design district area. Uh -huh. um, it, it remains to be seen it, w for future station areas whether it is applicable to use the existing regulations that are on the books for, say, compact design districts, or if different compact design district regulations um, are warranted for that particular station area. Mm -hmm. So that's for the future to, to, to behold and you'll get a say in okay. that. Yeah. And then um, I see uh, the, some, a lot of changes related to the Board of Adjustment. And I uh, wonder is, if you could just sort of, that, is that, that is state law state, and it changed the definition of variance and, and uh, what, what it, is the, how is that gonna change the way the Board of Adjustments operates? And really not much at all. Um, the biggest change actually is, is with the variance section in terms of they specify a specific set of findings that you have to use um, and it would be applicable to all Board of Adjustments throughout North Carolina. Um, mm -hmm. An additional thing that uh, item that we have added in there was, is an expiration for variances, which currently the UDO lacks. And we have a board, uh, instead of having things in the, um, in the ordinance, we have uh, the Board of Adjustments adopting rules and procedures. Is that, is that done already or is that? Well, it, yeah, as you may recall from being on the Board of Adjustment, there is a set of rules and procedures and this body has its own set of rules and procedures. Historic Preservation Commission has a set of rules and procedures and we're kind of trying, we're trying to reduce redundancies. So it's pretty much a repeat, the exactly, same things or exactly. it's not any ch kind of change in the no. authority or anything. No, it's just, no, in fact, we're changing it to mimic the actual ordinance standards for the planning as it's currently read in for the planning commission for how the body functions should refer to the rules of procedure yeah. and it shouldn't be necessarily spelled out in the ordinance okay thank you commissioner miller <clears throat> and just so you know the first round of questions you each each commissioner will have three minutes and then if we have a second round and a third round depend upon the time limit the time that we have Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on page three of the document, uh, this is in the Board of Adjustment uh, area. Pardon me? What? Yeah, well, my microphone doesn't work. Uh, so 
I'm a little troubled. What's, can, is there some place reposed, uh, probably not in the ordinance, but in the law that explains the difference between a necessary and an unnecessary hardship? It is reflective straight from state law. Yeah, but it, I haven't sure. actually gone back to look at the statute. Does the statute define an unnecessary I hardship? I don't recall offhand. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And then if you would, um, I see we've made some changes to the definitions, uh, or at least to the tables relating to uh, group homes and family care homes. Can you remind me what the difference is? Um, Page seven, and, it, and it also again on uh, eight, and then it comes up again later. Um, family care homes are specifically regulated in much more detail by the state. Um, so we are changing the definition. Our current definition for family care homes Clark, doesn't, doesn't really coincide with that the state, Clark, please. It didn't matter. state regulations. So uh, the recommendation from the, actually the city attorney's office was to just reference back to the state. Mm -hmm. I see that. I just wanted to be reminded what the actual distinction between a group home and a family care home is. Um, most of it is number of persons living in the... Family care home used to be it's up six, to six and below. Is it's it still six and that? below. It's still that. Correct. And do we treat... Do we make a distinction for what... How these people, uh, what their condition may be? We're really limited as to what we can uh, regulate based upon their condition. Um, the regulation, at least in the UDO, is, is, a little, is more extensive for group homes or such larger facilities than family care homes than with family care homes themselves. So, um, so for example, family care homes basically have a buy right allowance to be established as long as they meet a certain separation requirement um, within residential districts, but in group homes, uh, they need to seek a minor special use permit from the Board of Adjustment in order to I realize that, but so in this section of the UDO, and we describe these use categories, we have taken a group home, and it, then it used to say for the care and treatment of psychiatric blah, blah, we've taken all of that out. Correct. Uh, do we then say what a group home is somewhere in the it's ordinance? It's defined in the ordinance. Okay, so it's in the definition Correct. section. Correct. All right, thank you. And I just wanted, uh, you, you address this a, a little bit. I'm on page 15 of the, uh, the document. Uh, so now if a development, development plan specifically talks about uses and these would be development plans not in all zoning districts but in certain districts talks about uses uh, the need to go get a use permit from the board of adjustment would be obviated if you're dealing with it in the development plan do you foresee a, a distinction in the way as a community will be handling this when we go from a quasi-judicial to a legislative approval process um. Not really. In fact, it gives more flexibility for the community to raise concerns where you're in a quasi-judicial, as you're familiar with, you're, regular, you're, you're held to a very specific set of findings, and that can actually be very frustrating for a community um, to either counter uh, claims made by an applicant or um, just provide adequate testimony before the board to make a case for or, or, or as an opponent of a certain procedure, whereas through the legislative process, um, it actually gets a... Uh, uh, more of a hearing because it's going through two public hearing processes plus um, the broader uh, extent of the legislative process before the governing body. So I don't expect a, um, a lessening of the ability for the public to have concerns or raise concerns or to be proponents of um, a development plan. And it would apply to, it's an, it's an avenue for any development plan that's being offered no matter what the zoning district is. So it can't add uses. So if it's not a use, if it's a use that's currently not allowed in right. the district, you can't add it. But if it's a use that would normally require, if it's currently CG without a development plan, they would automatically have to get a use permit if that use required it. But if they're going, they're asking for a CG with a development plan and they add that use in and provide the additional more specificity, then if the elected bodies find that okay. But in order to get that special treatment, you're, you're going to have to talk about the use, also location, access, Correct. building height, size, all of those things must be there. Correct. Failure to cover them all means you're back to the, you're going to have a two-step process. It, you, right. If you decide not to opt for that option, then yes, you would still have to go for the Board of Adjustment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
All right, Commissioner Board. Just a couple things here. Um, back for a minute to the Board of Adjustment. Where are citizens going to be able to find these rules and procedures since they can't just They are currently the posted online under the Board of Adjustment. Okay. Um, group homes, that one disturbed me too. Can you explain to me from a citizen's point of view, is this going to have any impact in a group home that's already in a neighborhood? I guess it's more of a family care home. Um, or with um, someone coming into a neighborhood, is anything going to change that? No, no. The, the rules and procedures for establishing a group home are not changing. Okay. It's just that, yeah. Okay, sorry. It was vague to me. Um, page 1314, the transportation special use permit. Um, what was it? There was a, in, in the UDL, there was a long list of, of reasons and cases given. Let me just go back to that page. 13 and 14, where does that go? Yeah, it starts, on, it starts on 13 and goes on into 14. Yes. Um, what happened to those? I mean, they are relocated. Um, okay. I mentioned earlier that I was, that we were consolidating all. Okay, so um, I just. They're relocated, they, they okay. haven't gone away. They're okay, relocated. I just missed it. All right, thank you. They're in the transportation special use permit section? They're currently in a transportation special use permit section, but what we did was um, we have a special use permit section within Article 3, which covers minor and major special use permits. Then there's also, there was this TSUP section that's been in there for a number of years and actually dates back to the prior merged zoning ordinance. And then recently, with the adoption of the CD districts, there was the design special use permit uh, process and procedures, and that was put in a different section. So what we're doing is just putting them all under the special use permit section, and, and that's an article changing three. That. Article three, yes. Okay. And just one more on page twenty-nine. Um, I'm assuming it got moved instead of just deleted, but I suppose I could be wrong. Under private pools, all of the security rules about enclosing it and protecting it, where did that go? Those are actually handled through building inspections. This was an issue that came up through in front of the Joint City County Planning Commission uh, Committee with uh, redundant and sometimes contradictory uh, rules in terms of um, uh, the, the building requirements for these. And it was decided that uh, the UDO should focus on uh, uh, where um, or when and let the building inspections focus on how it's constructed. So it's, okay. it, it, so we're, the two departments aren't tripping over each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Huff. <clears throat> um, I have some questions about these courts, four okay, courts. Okay, commissioners, would you please speak into the mic because it's being televised and when you're not speaking into the mic, they cannot hear you back home. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, page 43, um, where you're describing the various designs of these co four courts on buildings, and you've crossed out some designs, some graphics, and you've added new graphics. Are you, are you then enforcing the graphic style on all four courts, or can, can, can four courts look different from? Oh, the, 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 the graphics are meant to be just a quick visual representation of the standards found below them. So oh. it's, it's, meant to, it's not meant to be look exactly like that, no. In it's just meant to give an example or a, or a picture of what they would generally look like. Right, because th there's some, um, I mean, it would really uh, confine them. I, I was curious about whether or not the stairs can be parallel to the sidewalk as on page 45 to the building, you see those stairs? Because you've crossed that out. I, I'm just curious if that, if that now is not a design, cannot be a design feature or, because you have um, a real I think everything is really staying exactly the same. The only okay. thing we're changing are the, well, in this instance, the only thing we're changing really are just the graphics. We're trying to update the graphics. Okay, because um, I had a question about the other, some other graphics, but that takes care of it. Now, um, vacant lots. Um, you're saying here that a lot uh, has to be planted with grass or landscape material. What if people want to use a vacant lot for a um, urban garden? That's allowed. It's yeah. allowed. Yeah. 
OK. Um, let's see. No, I got that. Just a minute. They're all over the place. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's a lot. Um, on page 65, you have all non-resident, uh, this is bike parking. Mm -hmm. Minimum of two bicycle parking spaces shall be required for all non-residential uses, 10,000 feet or more, blah, blah, blah. And then it says, bicycle parking shall be provided at a minimum rate of one bicycle parking space per 2,500 square feet. Well, how do you make one bicycle parking space? Because a rack holds two. That's true. Uh, we can take a look at that and see if that needs further modification. Okay. Um, the signs section, page 67. Um, these are a category of signs under D, 4D, 11.4.1, 2D. Um, it says signs, there are a number of uh, qualifications here, but the signs for properties for sale, lease, or rent will, can, can be removed or shall be removed when the contract is closed on the property for sale or rent. But then it says, in the same list of requirements, signs shall only be displayed from 12 p.m. noon on Friday to 8 a.m. the following Monday. How does that work? That is basically a, giving an allowance for the weekend, the, the, like the open house um, this way uh, types of provisions where it's allowing for um, those kinds of off-site, off-premise real estate signs without having them up for an unlimited amount of time. But, it, but it's the same kind of sign in four that says it shall be removed when a contract is closed. So it, it, it sound, what it sounds like from this language is that you've got a sign that can be up until the contract is closed, which could be quite a while, I presume, and, mm -hmm. and not just from 12 p.m. noon on Friday to 8 a.m. Monday. We'll it just sounds that way. We'll take a look at that and see if we can clarify it further for you. Okay. Um, okay, on page 69, right-of-way. It says, right-of-way de dedication shall be for the purposes of conformance to adopted plans. This is you my can last, contain. this is my last thing. This is, this is probably just real quick. Um, it's mm -hmm. uh, for the accommodation of other public purposes such as, but not limited to streets, sidewalks, bicycle facilities, and utilities, dedication of right of way that does not satisfy or aid in satisfying an identified public purpose shall not be shown or approved on any applicable site plan or plat. plat. Mm -hmm. What kind of right of way would that be? There are times when um, applicants propose uh, right of way to get out of other ordinance requirements uh, in terms of it, the best uh, <laughs> instance I can say is that there's a uh, project boundary buffers or a long right of way. Um, you don't have to provide buffers mm -hmm. um, if it's a certain width or greater of right of way and sometimes um, applicants may provide additional right of way in order not to have to provide that buffer because once you've dedicated mm -hmm. it, you're out of that buffer requirement. Um, I'm blanking on any other instances, but I'm sure there are. But basically, it's putting a, a regulatory tool that not only planning, but transportation department and other departments can hang their hat on and say, no, we're not taking this dedication. OK, thank you. That's it. Thank you. Are there any additional questions with reference to this uh, text change 8? Okay, I have Commissioner Miller. Anyone else? Okay, Commissioner. Okay. Why don't you let Charlie go? He hasn't, he hasn't been around once. Okay, Charlie. Gibbs. Uh, I just have one question uh, generally about the historic district overlay. Is this any more or less restrictive? Uh, for instance, in allowing uh, compatible design within, uh, I know the Historic uh, Commission reviews these things. Uh, 
I, I guess my question is we're not ba boxing ourselves in any more or any less no. uh, than, than what we were. And there is an allowance for appeal for uh, something that would be compatible. Uh, it doesn't have, to, doesn't have to match each of the building structures in the historic district regardless of where it is. This does not impact any of the current criteria regulations that the Historic Preservation Commission needs to consider um, in granting a certificate of appropriateness, or even staff when they have to do administrative ones. Okay, that, that, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Commissioner Miller, two minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Speaking to the mic. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I have a hard time with mics. It doesn't work. Okay, um, so looking at on page 36, you have two new tables. And uh, so in, in the table under two, just which residential development can go into these uh, uh, non-residential districts, we talk about townhouses. And then down in the lower table, we talk, and in the text, we talk about townhomes. Same use? Yes. All right. Yes. Um, and then turning over then to um, page 39 with height articulation in the design districts. Can you tell me what the changes that we're making there as it relates to uh, height articulation with podium height? I don't see where we're changing anything um, except reorganizing the text for a clearer read. I don't see any substantial changes at all. Wouldn't that also be true with this section two concerning the upper story setbacks? Correct. All right, thanks. And then going over to, um, um, I'm on page 41 now in the general standards and it says if a property has street frontage on all sides a single street frontage can be designated as a service frontage on the site plan and thereby it be exempt from meeting all frontage type standards where designated that's current text oh, is that current yeah, text does correct. that mean that the service aspects of the building have to be located there no it's just it's just it, the applicant can designate a side as a service side even if they're not going to use it for service and well, they would have to i mean they would have to there'd have to be de demonstrative details on the development plan that demonstrate how it's being a service entrance okay do we actually say that somewhere i'm worried that yes. somebody i'm watching this how we're applying these frontage right. regulations to to real cases well this and and i'm not satisfied in in every especially with the with these big multi multi-family buildings we're building that we're actually getting what we thought we were going to get mm -hmm. and i'm worried about having language in the code that that allows people to to manipulate the the way these buildings look in ways that we that we're not and regulating and we we actually hear that we are actually under process of doing a it's been about five years or so since the first design district has been adopted and a couple years um, earlier with the compact neighborhood district compact design districts and we are actually going through a, an evaluation and assessment of the current standards and seeing how they're working and taking the comments we've received and going to take more comments and go through a much more formal and intensive review of the of the current standards and is that the line item in the work plan it has it is line item in the work plan. Thank you very much. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Any additional round three? Okay, if not, uh, can I get a motion on? I make the motion that we uh, approve that text amendment. Second. Okay, it's been motion and second that we approve text change 130001. All in favor of approving this, raise your right hand. All opposition, raise your right hand. Text change TC130001 has passed 11 to 0. Thank you. Uh, next, we Mr. have Chairman. a public hearing, open a public hearing with plans 
and it's the work program. Mr. Chairman, I have a question um, for staff. Um, we noted some, some changes. Um, would that be changed before it goes to the city council? There were we, yes, we would take a look at the changes and see, um, take a further review and see if we need to make further clarifications, we will do that before it goes to council and board of commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Good Director, evening. Director Medlin. Good evening, uh, Steve Medlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. I know it's been a while since I've been here. Um, as you are probably familiar, as part of the interlocal agreement, uh, the department is required to prepare both an annual budget and an annual work program that has to be ultimately processed through the Joint City County Planning Committee, through the Planning Commission, and then ultimately adopted uh, by both of the elected officials, uh, boards, excuse me. Um, what I would like to do is give you a brief overview of the departmental structure for this next uh, fiscal year, which begins July 1st of uh, this year and runs through June 30th of next year. The department, as you are aware, is composed of 35 FTEs, or full-time employees, or, or equivalencies. Uh, of those 36 employees, we're divided into two divisions, one in the development side of the shop, which is uh, managed by Mr. Young, uh, and the long-range planning section or division, which is managed by Mr. Keith Luck, who I think has been before you before. Within each of those two divisions, there are actually subsections or, 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 uh, uh, that are composed of groups like our land use group. Uh, Mr. Uh, Whiteman is the, uh, the supervisor of that group, so you're familiar seeing him coming before you. Our development re group, uh, review group, which is the group that uh, reviews site plans and subdivisions. Uh, and also deals with uh, street closings, things of that nature, and our zoning administration staff, which are, in essence, our, our zoning compliance officers as well as our site compliance officer. Uh, on the long-range strategic planning side, we are um, composed of three divisions, research and uh, public information. Uh, for those of you that have visited the planning department, uh, if you've come to the front uh, intake area, that is our public information office, which is staffed all day long by three uh, planners that serve uh, as journalists that provide information to the public uh, via both, uh, well, via email, telephone call, and walk-in. Uh, that is also the group that does a lot of the data analysis that you see coming before you, maps and things of that nature are generated by that group. Uh, our policy section is headed by um, Aaron Kane. You'll, uh, I think you all have seen a lot of his work and Hannah Jacobson are the primary people that come before you on plan amendments, things of that nature. And then our Urban Design Center, which basically are the folks in our, uh, our, our um, urban design group that work with the design districts uh, that Mr. Stock was referring to, as well as uh, are the folks that uh, are primarily tasked with the historic preservation task within the department. Um, we are uh, asking for funding for those 36 positions in this next year's budget. Uh, we have been provided a target budget of a little over $3 million, roughly $3,100,000. Of that, uh, $2.7 million is directly associated with personnel costs, salaries, benefits, uh, things of that nature, and roughly a little over $300,000 is associated with operational overhead, paper, pencils, um, what you would expect, just to, to keep the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the wheels uh, turning. Um, as you are probably familiar, the work program is divided into three main sections, even though they're divided even more into divisional uh, separations as well. Uh, primarily the work program uh, is composed of those projects that are regulatory in nature, those things that are mandated by both state, federal, and also local ordinances, those things that we absolutely have to do. Um, a good uh, comparison of what that is, you see a lot of them through zoning cases, plan amendments. That also is inclusive of zoning cases, I mean, uh, subdivisions, site plans, and also Board of Adjustment uh, applications, as well as things like street closings. Uh, a lot of permits that are required through the department are processed as regulatory. Uh, things like our limited agricultural permits, home occupation permits, uh, things of that nature. Uh, we also have ongoing projects and processes assigned to the department that are related to city and county policies. Um, one of those that you're probably most familiar with is the regulation of mobile vending, uh, food trucks. 
uh, the planning department is the department that is tasked by the city uh, to enforce and regulate that and as well as manage the, uh, the database uh, for uh, permits uh, for that process. Uh, the third are our total discretionary types of activities, those things that typically fall into what uh, you saw on the organizational charter, the discretionary uh, strategic planning initiatives. Uh, those are things that we have total discretion over in terms of adding uh, to the um, uh, to the to the work program based on uh, adequate resources being provided to the department. Uh, as I mentioned, there are actually five overall major program areas: development review, zoning administration, conference of planning, public information, and research support, and department management. Uh, if you actually looked at the work program and counted those lines, there are actually about 85 different distinct uh, responsibilities the department has responsible. Uh, responsibility for over the course of any given year. Um, within the discretionary initiatives within the work program, we are proposing, as you uh, probably have, have already realized, uh, a number of major initiatives that we have allocated staff for, including the Affordable Housing Initiative, uh, our Comprehensive Plan Community Profile, uh, Affordable Housing Incentives, which are changes to the Unified Development Ordinance, uh, significant changes to the wireless communication facility revisions, uh, a text amendment, uh, design district update. That was what Mr. Stock was alluding to, I think, in response to uh, Commissioner Miller's question. Uh, we also have to deal with uh, mandates that are imposed on us by both the federal and state government uh, as related to text amendments from bringing our codes into compliance with both federal and state standards. Uh, we are also in the process of completing the local historic review criteria consolidation project. Hopefully we'll have that completed by the end of this, uh, this calendar year. Um, we are, once that's completed, we'll be prepared to move forward with the Holloway Street uh, Historic District. That had, a lot of work has gone on with that, but we're kind of keeping that on hold until we could get the review criteria uh, project completed. We're going to begin work on uh, some of our design districts. Uh, we have a, uh, a district that is referred to as the Medical Center Design District, which is the Irwin Road uh, compact neighborhood in, adjacent to the hospital. We're not anticipating that we will come close to completing that over the next year, but we will begin work on that. Uh, we also are anticipating uh, having to spend a considerable amount of staff resources working on privately initiated design district rezoning and plan amendments, one of which is already in the door, one of which we're expecting will come in very shortly. And we have been designated as a resource to, uh, to city and county agencies to provide public facilities design and consulting uh, as it relates to both public engagement and also design work. And that is a new initiative within the department. Um, very quickly, um, it, I'll be happy to answer questions that you have, but what I will tell you is that the, 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 the work program that you have before you fully allocates all 36 uh, employees at least time-wise to provide services as it relates to each of those work task items. Okay, thank you. Is that we have no one signed up to speak from the public on that item? Okay, is there anyone in the audience would like to speak during the public? Okay, I will close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. I have, I'm gonna start this side, this questions. I have Miller, Whitley, Muskie. Okay, Commissioner Miller. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Medlin, uh, I'm concerned that we have, I, I'm aware that the, the planning staff has a petition in from a neighborhood for a uh, historic, uh, new uh, local historic district, mm -hmm. and it's not on the work plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's sat now for quite a long time. I wonder if the petition even has, pr well, I'm sure it's still legally valid, but mm -hmm. I wonder whether it, it's practically valid after so many years. And I, just between you and me, I'm a little worried that we're, we're gonna go work on a privately initiated design district while we have this other application pending. I realize you have limited people, you have limited funds, and you have, you have allocated all mm -hmm. the capacity that your uh, budget request and your people allow, but if, if it were me, mm -hmm. I would deal with this long pending business which is festering and causing considerable dissatisfaction before we picked up something else. Sure. Uh, it's a question of, of priorities. Um, I personally, if it were me, would not treat these applications or these petitions for local historic district 
as discretionary items. Uh, it seems to me they're people who are following processes outlined in the UDO and they have a reasonable expectation of action. Uh, I would work on those first. That's, you don't just walk in and ask for a local historic district. You have to get a lot of petitions signed. It's a, it's, mm -hmm. it, Dorothy has to bring in a pretty big witch's broomstick uh, whereas this privately initiated uh, design district thing is purely discretionary, uh, and that's the way I would allocate those resources. Uh, I would be more satisfied with the work plan if I saw that, uh, mm -hmm. that local historic district on here, at least in, in front of this, this other item. Thank you. If I that's can all respond. I have, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, my, very quickly, my one response to that, Commissioner Miller, is that I think there's one misperception that everyone has that even though there are 36 people in the planning department, that all 36 people can do everything within the planning department. That is not the case, and that's not the case with, as it relates to historic preservation efforts. The, the dilemma that I have is I have one half-time employee, FTE, associated with historic preservation that has the experience, the expertise, and the background that can basically do that work. I don't have the capacity to move other people into those roles because they don't have that experience. They don't have those certifications. So we're doing what we can with the resources, <coughs> excuse me, that, that we have. So I would understand what you're saying, but we're doing the best we can with what we got, and there is no capacity to move around the, as you've suggested. Commissioner Whitney. Well, I think you gave me that same answer. You're going to give me the same answer. <laughs> but I, I need to tell you that um, we're working very hard in East Durham. Um, I, I thank you for the Holloway Historic District Plan. I think that's number something. Um, um, that's a butt to Cleveland Holloway. Mm -hmm. You know, it just makes sense to, because you've done so much there that you fit that in because it's something up and you can see it. But we're spending a lot of money in on East Durham and, um, and we really don't have a master plan for the area. We know that that area is gonna be impacted by um, transportation, uh, both rail and by the East End Connector, mm -hmm. you know? And we don't have a plan for that. We know that it's a, an industrial park coming. There are a whole lot of good things are happening there, but it's just, you know, whatever happens, happens. You know, um, so how do we get more Specific. How do how do we get it, how do we get it focused so that um, we can create more synergy, you know, without planning? Well, if I can respond, first of all, I think it's a misnomer to say there is not a master plan. There is a master plan. That master plan is the future land use comprehensive plan for Durham City and County, which was adopted by both the City Council and the Board of County Commissioners in 2005 and occasionally gets uh, modified. Um, obviously, within that comprehensive plan, there are action items, and as you are aware, through uh, annual reports that you receive, uh, we track how we're implementing that comprehensive plan. There is nothing in that comprehensive plan that is inconsistent that would not allow for redevelopment of that area, but obviously that's a separate discussion because it involves private monies of which we don't have any ability to necessarily direct to that area. That, that is something the market drives a, a great deal. Um, in terms of a specialized plan, I'm not sure what value you, you know, would be created by spending a lot of resources trying to redo what has already been done um, that has already established, let me finish, that has already established reasonable mixture of uses that allows for commercial, residential, and industrial development in that area. I'm finished. Yeah, well, 2005, there was no East End Connector. It was actually reflected on the plan. Yes. <laughs> there was no East End Connector. Um, and um, 2005, there was no conversation. Well, we did talk about rail, mm -hmm. but how it would impact um, 
both housing and economic development, all those things that happen around rail system. Um, so is, is not time to revisit some of that? Well, we are with some of our design districts, and Austin Avenue is certainly one of those design districts that we'll be working on at some point in the future. So to answer your question, yes, we'll be refining that down at that point. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Smesky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, okay, so we have brought up affordable housing, and I'm glad to see not one but two initiatives um, that kind of talk to affordable housing. Can you explain what the differences are between them and why we have two instead of just one? I mean, um, the simple answer is one is actually a text amendment that will create revised standards within the Unified Development Ordinance to incentivize affordable housing, uh, basically trying to take what's currently in the ordinance, which is a density bonus for affordable housing, and trying to make it into something that is actually workable. Um, it, it, as I'm sure you all have heard at various venues, those provisions have actually been on the ordinance for 10 years plus and have never been utilized by the development community, basically because it just does not drive the you know the numbers that the developers need to to have in order for a uh, for an affordable housing project to be uh, successfully developed. Um, Mr. Young and Mr. Kane are working on that at this point. Um, they're looking at other incentive opportunities as well as how we can leverage other um, departments to work with us very closely on trying to figure out ways to incentivize through other programs outside of the zoning ordinance. Um, in addition, um, we, as you rightfully pointed out, um, we are currently working uh, in conjunction uh, on both um, the plan level in terms of the strategic area um, infrastructure plan, which is taking a look at what is going to be needed in proximity to transit stations. And as part of that effort, we're looking at what is it going to take in terms of incentivizing uh, affordable housing in that area through the provision of potentially public improvements and what the cost potentially may be with that. In addition, uh, we're working very closely uh, with our counterparts in community development. Uh, as you're probably familiar, um, uh, they, they do a, a five-year plan uh, that they're in the process of working on for, for, for affordable housing. Uh, they've agreed to help us by including additional additional things in that plan uh, that will help us move move it move us closer to uh, to providing affordable housing I'm sorry oh no no I didn't um, and I'm sure I'm, I'm quickly forgetting something else here um, as it relates to the to the work program uh, obviously the design districts that we're talking about are going to have um, uh, at least some component dealing with affordable housing provision uh, as you are probably familiar, I think you all had actually adopted a resolution that, uh, that was forwarded to both the elected boards for adoption that uh, um, required that we work to uh, in, uh, increase affordable housing in proximity to transit stations within a half mile, providing at least 15% of those units as affordable housing units. Um, if did you address the housing affordability initiative? Can you tell me what that is? That's a combination of all those things. Okay, that's the that's the rail and, and other it's, thing it's with the triangle a, J. Okay. It's just a, a, conci a concise title for, for a lot of those efforts. Great. All right, thank you. Commissioner Patch. I actually, when I looked over this this past week, and um, I, was, I was very impressed with it. I think it, it says a lot for the planning department, and um, every one of you doing a great job in that. Oh, thank you. And uh, you answered several questions in your last statement, so I don't have any questions. Okay. Uh, second round of questions. I have Mr. Miller, Smusky. Second round, Mr. Boyd. Okay. So let me start with people that haven't spoken. I wanted to ask about the um, the privately initiated design districts. Can you talk mm -hmm. about where those are? Uh, the one that has actually been submitted is a uh, design district application for 
what is we commonly referred to as Patterson Place, which is located off 15501, close to I-40. Uh, we are aware and have been in conversations with individuals who are interested in, in potentially submitting a second application for Lee Village, which is the area immediately adjacent to I-40 and 54 in South Durham. Um, but those are the two that uh, potentially may be in, well, we know one is in the offing, the other potentially may be. Commissioner Winders. Uh, I wanted to ask about that. On, Turn your on mic that, on. Uh, on that same topic, mm -hmm. um, so we've been uh, thinking that in the affordable housing um, res resolution, I think we're talking about that we need compact district plans or station area plans. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's like sort of the first step in, in um, uh, getting to affordable housing or mixed income housing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so are you saying that, so is this privately initi initiated uh, development um, district, design district? It's like a substitute for the publicly initiative district and jumping in front of the uh, ones in, in the central Durham? Well, first of all, they're not jumping in front of other design districts. Um, what I will tell you is that uh, it is a, a mechanism to uh, move an application into the process, yes, but is it gonna be distinctly different than the processes we would use if it were a staff-initiated effort? Um, only from the perspective that those applications are going to be zoning applications or plan applications versus the typical uh, plan amendment applications, excuse me, uh, versus the, the approach that we did with 9th Street or even the downtown design district. Uh, it's important to remember that um, through the work that we initially did with the downtown district and uh, a lot with the, the 9th Street district, we've kind of built the basic building blocks for design districts. Uh, we're obviously having to tweak those because uh, we're finding that, you know, they don't necessarily do what we want them to do or they're not as clear as they need to be. Uh, but in essence, all this is doing is just me moving those forward. I will tell you that both uh, Leaf, Lee Village and the, uh, the medical center ones were, were ones that we had identified initially as those that were kind of at a critical point. Uh, that uh, we felt like there was a lot of development uh, interest in those areas and so more than likely we would have suggested the priority of those anyway. Patterson Place not so much uh, even though there is obviously a lot of development pressure in that area as well. Um, it's, it's just unique that a property owner wants to pay uh, for an application just to move it into the system faster. Unfortunately, it t still takes the same amount of staff time to process, process those things. It doesn't, they don't get handled any more quickly. We still have to go through the same exercise, the same efforts of public engagement, and developing what the standards will be, going through uh, the public hearing process, all that still stays the same. Well, how will that 15% goal for um, affordable housing uh, work into the, uh, the, the That's plans something for those? The, the I can't answer that because well, that's something we'll have to work on. It would not be a good idea to to make those plan amendments before we at least got the housing uh, affordability, uh, the housing assessment done. Mm -hmm. I understand seems. your point. But, <laughs> uh, knowing how slow, and I, I shouldn't say slow, knowing how the, the process of, of development of these types of things occur, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen within a year. It's going to take the time. So. Um, my expectation would be that some of these pieces will come together as we're going through that process. Okay, uh, Commissioner Whitley, two minutes. Steve, um, when we're talking about the affordable, um, affordable, affordable housing, it, it brings back my point. On the corner of driver and um, Angie Avenue, mm -hmm. you have specifically on driver, you have industrial on one side of the street and on the other side is multi-residential. Mm -hmm. If we put residential once that rail comes, comes through mm -hmm. and with the plant on the other side of the, the rail, mm -hmm. 
if something happens, we're going to be making a terrible mistake, you know? Mm -hmm. And the time to change it is now, but the plan, the, um, the plan that, the map, I mean, the master plan for the area has it in there, mm -hmm. you know? And I understand, I, Lord knows, I would love to have a rail stop <coughs> at, that, at Driver, but then when I think about it, it would be too dangerous, you know? Um, and we have to change the zonings to make some of this work. We have plenty of land still in East Durham that we can do that with further down or further up, you know. Um, but they're talking about um, residential housing um, in that block, and that would be a terrible mistake. I you can respond to his question. I, I don't have a response for him. I mean, at this point, I, as I've said, you know, if we get the direction to move forward with a plan, we'll certainly take that under advisement. But at this point, there has been no direction to do so. Um, you know, if you have specific concerns about that area, sit down and draw up something, and we'll be glad to sit down and talk with you about it. All right, Commissioner Smusky, two minutes. Thank you. I, I wanted to save these comments for the second round, but I, I agree with Mr. Pantit. There was a lot of work that goes into this, and I was I was quite impressed with the detail, you know, the description, responsibilities. Can you speak into your mic? The re okay, so I was real impressed with, with all this, but you said something earlier that struck me while I was reading this, and there seems to be a lot of emphasis here about street closings. Are street closings that common? As much as I hate to say it, we get a lot of street closings that come through the department. And here of late, we seem to have at least one or two a month that come through. I hadn't realized it was yeah. that big well, an issue. Well, case in point, there are a lot of unopened right-of-ways within the city and county of Durham. Uh, by that, they're paper streets, streets that have been dedicated at some time for, for a purpose that have never been opened, never used. Or if they've been open, they've never been uh, transferred to public maintenance and the properties were never developed. Uh, so we routinely, uh, I know today I saw two applications come through for, for new street closing applications that had come in the door. And that is actually a statutory uh, process that is established by state statute that we're required to, to, uh, to handle for, for both the city and the county. So it's just one of those things I, I didn't realize it was such a big work yeah. item. thank Pat you. do you know how many street closings on an annual basis that were Scott just to give you a context it's we this is Scott Lightman we used to get four or five a year and then all of a sudden in the last year we started getting like 15 to 20 so yeah. it's it's the new hot thing I guess I would say it's free land because the property reverts to the adjacent property owners when it's closed, but that's not quite true. It's not quite free. Okay, Director Mellon, I have one question. It's related to the uh, planning fees, mm -hmm. the fees that you charge for, that's charged for applications, for various adjustments, for permits, for plaques. For, is that money collected going to the general fund? Um, the way the budget works is that all revenues that are generated by the department actually do go into the general fund. They do not come back to the department in any form. Uh, the way the actual budget for the department is structured, uh, what they do is the 3.1 million, uh, we are anticipating that we will generate a little over $900,000 in revenues next year, which is down from where we projected this year because we've actually found that the, uh, the economic forecast that we see is actually flat for the next year number of applications have actually begun to decrease again versus increase, contrary to what you're hearing. Um, and so that $900,000 is taken off the top. And then the residual portion is then split between the city and county. The current interlocal local is 50-50 split. That is currently under, under, uh, under conversation between the manager's office as to whether or not there needs to be any modifications to that split. And that will be defined later this year. All right. Are there any additional questions from the commissioners to Director Metlin? 
If not, what's your pleasure for this item, this agenda item? So, so if, I, if I can, um, all comments that we receive will actually be forwarded on uh, to the elected officials as comment received from the Planning Commission for their consideration as they're looking at the annual work program, just so you're aware. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the work plan and all comments that have been made before this body on the work plan um, be approved. Be forwarded to the be forwarded to the be forwarded to the elected city body. County. Second. Okay, it's been motion and second that we approve the work plan and all comments made be forwarded to the elected officials. <clears throat> all in favor of this, let it be known by raising right hand. <clears throat> all opposed, raise your right hand. The work plan has passed 10 to yep. 10, one against. Thank you. <clears throat> so the next agenda item is under new business and it's the transit area homing or housing. Good evening. I'm Laura Woods with the planning department and the presentation this evening on demographics and housing within transit areas in Durham will be in three parts. I will present some basic demographic information. Then I will turn the floor over to Patrick McDonough of uh, Triangle Transit, who will discuss um, housing conditions in the transit areas. He will then turn it over to Bergen, Bergen Watterson of TJ Cog, who will give us some insight on affordability in Durham. Now, in discussing demographics, I'm going to focus on these station areas, which are in and around downtown Durham. My reason for doing so is it's easy to extract the demographic information because uh, some of the information is only available at census block group levels, and the block groups for downtown and urban areas are relatively compact, and therefore the data fits rather well with our half mile radii that I've illustrated here. So I'll be focusing on LaSalle, Duke, Duke Medical Center, 9th Street, Buchanan, uh, Durham Station, Dillard and Austin Avenues. Some of the suburban transit areas actually the data is a bit difficult to extract because the census block groups are rather large here at Lee Village which you've already mentioned once this evening. Uh, this, is station, this is tracked 20.18, block group three, and as you see, Lee Village transit area only occupies a relatively small portion of that. And the fact is the demographic information for part of the area may have very little in common with the transit area. So, at least in the interim this evening, I'll be focusing on the more downtown stations. Now then, uh, this is uh, race ethnicity data for Durham County, and we are a community of minorities. And it's only a little different if you look at the city of Durham. A uh, very large African-American population, white population, uh, considerable and rising Hispanic or Latino population. Notice that the Asian or Asian American population stands at about 5%. But if we move to the station areas west, LaSalle and Duke Medical Center, notice that the Asian population is very large for Durham as a whole. That's, that's a reflection of the Duke University student body. The relatively low percentage of African Americans is part of the historical heritage of settlement patterns for Durham. As we move east to 9th Street, the, you're, you're still seeing the influence of the Duke University student body. The African American population is beginning to go up a bit. The Hispanic population is dropping a bit. If you move to Buchanan, you're beginning to lose that influence of the Duke student body. The African-American population is beginning to rise. 
by the time you get to Durham Station, uh, yes? The numbers on the pie graph are not the same as the numbers on the uh, scale, the, the key in this one in Buchanan or mm -hmm. in Durham Station. Simply an oversight on my part in formatting. I apologize. The numbers on the, um, on, on the pie chart are correct. Um, now, by the time we get to Durham, thank you for that. I'll correct that the next time I do this, this show. Um, when we get to Durham Station, it's interesting that downtown Durham actually is very similar to the city of Durham as a whole. It's kind of a microcosm for Durham. But if you only move a couple of blocks east to Dillard, again, uh, the heritage of geographic settlement kicks in and you have a very large number of African Americans, much smaller white population. The Hispanic Latino population's kind of the average for Durham. Move a little farther, it's very much the same. Your Hispanic Latino population's gone up a bit and the African American population has risen just a bit. Now then, looking at age cohort data. You can actually kind of group the stations um, due to the similarities there. For instance, the four stations in the west, let's call them station areas west, LaSalle, Duke Medical Center, Ninth, and Buchanan have very similar demographics with regard to age cohorts. Durham Station stands alone. It's more typical of Durham as a whole and Dillard and Alston share a great deal in common. Looking at the population, 65 years and older, notice that in Durham County, shown at the bottom of the chart, it's about 9.8%. Um, all areas, the station areas are somewhat less than that. The station areas east, Dillard and Alston, come pretty close. Durham Station and the station areas west particularly much lower, obviously, again, you're looking at the influence of the very large Duke student body. Looking at older workers, your middle-aged population, 40 to 64, stationary east is very high, and that's, that is a very interesting statistic. As you see, it's quite a bit higher than Durham County as a whole, whereas stationary is west and Durham Station are quite a bit lower. Looking at your young adult population, 22 to 39, obviously you're going to see a jump in Station Areas West and Durham Station is a relatively young demographic, um, coming pretty close to the Durham County average and it's somewhat lower than the Durham County average in the two Eastern stations. Looking at the population 18 to 21, no surprise there, Station Area West is enormous. Duke University student body again. Um, it's also quite high compared to Durham County as a whole in Station Area East and Durham Station, however. The population to, uh, of five to seven, uh, five to 17, the population, the school age population, and this is an interesting statistic, is much lower in all of the groupings of our station areas and it's very low at Dillard and Austin. Whereas the population that is less than five years of old, five years of age is rather higher than Durham County as a whole and Station Aries East and very low and Durham Station and Station Aries West where you have a lot of young adults who do not have children, have not, well, presumably not. Looking at poverty rate, and, and this is a pretty significant um, graph here, 19.1% in Durham County as a whole, all of these station areas are higher than that. Of course, Station Area West is, well, it's kind of foxing us because, again, you have a large student population. Students don't earn a lot of money. I'm not sure you could really consider them in poverty, but as you see, it's very high in the two eastern stations, Dillard and Alston. And it's not surprising, looking at median household income, Station Aries East is far lower than is the average for Durham County. Interestingly enough, 
it's quite a bit lower in Durham Station and Station Area West as well. Now this is a very interesting statistic and touches on the whole question of a need for mass transit. Households lacking a personal vehicle, that red line indicates the average for Durham County, 8.7%, 8, 8 but as you see, it's very high in the two eastern Durham stations, Austin and Dillard, and quite, quite a bit higher in LaSalle, but again, a lot of students don't own vehicles. Owner-occupied housing, much lower in all the station areas compared to Durham County as a whole. Conversely, renter-occupied housing is very high. Vacant housing is quite a bit higher in the eastern Durham stations and is generally higher for all of the station areas, although 9th Street actually has a lower vacancy rate than Durham County as a whole. Now then, I will turn over the next section over to Patrick McDonough, who will talk about state of repair data for the housing and the transit areas. Thank you, Laura, and thank you to the Commission for having us here this evening. The data I'm going to review for you this evening is data that we collected uh, last summer. Uh, so it is a bit dated because, as Laura just pointed out in her final slide with a number of renters, we do have a good deal of turnover in most of the station areas along the, the urban section of the rail proposed rail corridor in Durham. So um, I, I think you'll see things like 9.7 percent, but recognizing that it was last summer and that people do move, we recognize that we took a snapshot in time, but that, you know, as we move into the future, this does become mildly dated. Um, nevertheless, I think the overall trends from the data resonate both with what you'll see from Laura and also from Bergen and uh, also do give us some uh, opportunities to think about policy in the station areas. So what did we do? Um, we sat down with some of the county planning staff, Aaron Kane and his team, Hannah Jacobson, and looked at what data did we have in tax records about condition. And we found that we did have condition records in Durham that were pretty good. We asked the tax office, they said that they felt that they were about 80% correct. Um, but we thought could we improve on that to get close to a 95 to 100% sense of the state of repair in the various neighborhoods. Um, we tried to put together a protocol. We got some help from the, uh, the GIS folks here who programmed an iPad for um, a junior member of our staff to go out and collect data neighborhood by neighborhood, and it was, uh, I think, a very effective data collection. We stayed within a half mile of the area around the stations. There were some places where that overlapped. We uh, stuck with residential properties only um, because we thought that getting into commercial might be more complicated. Um, so we did that, and we went sort of neighborhood by neighborhood and looked at various different um, buildings, and we rated them in five categories. I'm going to go through each of them one by one. The first category was good, things that have been recently built or in, you know, near excellent condition. Seven percent of the properties, this is in the Alston Avenue neighborhood right here, an example of what a house would be if it was classified as good. Um, normal, sort of standard maintenance, so maybe a house that's been around for a while, has been kept up well, but is showing some normal, you know, signs of wear and tear that any in you know, engaged homeowner or landlord is taking care of those things as they come, fixing them as they go, not leaving things unrepaired. But, you know, definitely there's a, a maintenance cycle that's, that's ongoing. And you'll find that this is far and away the biggest portion of all the, the properties along the, the combined station area, 67.4%. Um, and I think, that, I think this is the 9th Street station area, this one. Fair. Uh, these are places where when you're going by on the street, you can see some cosmetic concerns or maybe things that might be... Um, needing towards, a, a trending towards, if we leave that a little bit longer, there could be a structural repair that's needed to the building that's easily visible from the street. Um, that was about 22 to 23 percent of the properties. This picture here is in the Buchanan Station area. Um, poor, in, conser in need of considerable work, but still habitable. Um, this was something that I think the, somebody said that, uh, good, a good quote here is, if you were um, going to put it on the market for resale, it would be classified as a fixer-upper or something that would need work before the next occupant would likely move in. Um, this one is in Buchanan. Um, the final one here is unsound, uh, unhabitable in current condition. Um, less than 1% uh, of properties overall. This, this building was in the Dillard Station area. And so if we look at all of these different types of properties and 
um, sort of look at a neighborhood. This is the Buchanan neighborhood. Uh, the Buchanan station is at the center of the circle. The downtown Durham station is the pink, the pink dot to the right, but also inside the circle. But we're focusing on the distance from Buchanan. So if you look at um, the sort of uh, three different neighborhoods here, we have uh, sort of Trinity Park uh, abutting the, the Duke East campus on the north side, um, Birch Avenue, and then uh, Moorhead Hill, the west end. And you can see there's sort of varying levels um, of uh, what's good or normal or fair. Very little on the poor or unsound sides in, in any of these stationaries. Only a few properties uh, scattered here and there. Um, there are some places where you will see multiple properties that fit into the, say, the fair or some that are fair and one or two that are poor uh, adjacent to each other. So one of the questions that I think when we talk about affordable housing in station areas is that we need to think about if there are places where sometimes uh, helping maintaining an existing unit may be the best strategy to keep a unit affordable or if a unit um, is actually kind of moving towards too far gone, is it better to encourage redevelopment in a, a mixed income or a 15% inclusive format? And the thing that this data, I think, gives us is a sense of are there places in the neighborhood um, where you might try to encourage one strategy or another working with community development and planning, depending upon what's going on in the neighborhood. And of course, hearing from the residents to hear what they'd like to see in the neighborhood, too. Um, trying to break this out by uh, different station areas. Uh, Lee Village, Patterson Place, and Martin Luther King Jr. stations all over sort of in more uh, southern Durham. Uh, High, high to mid-90s on normal or good for the structures. These places are newer parts of the city. This makes sense. The older parts of the city are going to have more uh, wear and tear. Uh, South Square, LaSalle, and Duke Medical. As we get into the Duke Medical Center uh, and LaSalle area, you're starting to see some older structures. The uh, fair uh, group is expanding a bit. Some, again, minor in the poor and unsound categories. As we move into 9th Street, Buchanan, and downtown, though, you begin to see where the age of the housing stock begins to play a role. We do see a greater number of um, buildings in the fair category. The poorer on sound is, is staying small there at the, the 1 to 3 percent. And then in Austin and Dillard, there's a, a bit higher level of aging or perhaps in some cases disinvestment. Um, we do have the larger portions of poor and unsound in the 4 to 6 percent range there, but also more in the fair category. So, um, overall, this gives us a little bit of a picture on another way in which the housing stock itself varies from station area to station area. Um, we've been learning about the demographics, we've been learning about the station area uh, housing that's out there, the, but the takeaways, uh, most residential structures in the transit areas are, are in normal condition. Um, the percentage of structures that are fair, poor, or unsound varies significantly depending on where you are. And we think that with this inventory, um, when, uh, as uh, Director Medlin spoke earlier about Pat and his team looking at things like what's the right mix of incentives to get towards those 15 percent affordable goals, this housing inventory, we hope, is a good piece of baseline data that we can come back to and think about how we would you know, develop strategies that would get towards those goals in the long run. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague uh, Bergen from TJ Cog. Hi. Bergen Watterson from Triangle J Council of Governments. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, so I have a few slides that are just going to talk about um, housing affordability and then a new way of looking at housing affordability. Not necessarily new, but uh, not a more traditional way of looking at it. So traditionally, experts have looked at housing affordability as if you spend 30% of your income or more, then you're what's considered to be housing burdened. Um, those spend, yeah. Uh, they use 30% as the upper limit of for, afford for affordability. Um, and so to sort of back this up, the Bureau of Labor Statistics said in 2012 that the average housing expenditure was roughly a third of household income, so that backs this up. Um, and as you can see in Durham, the percent that a household spends on housing varies greatly by income. You can see the lowest, the poorest 20% of Durham households end up spending three quarters of their income on housing, whereas the richest 20% spend 11. So it's not equal across households. Uh, 
Um, so experts are starting to look at housing and transportation costs together. Um, since more affordable housing options tend to be located farther from the city centers and farther from daily needs, schools, work, um, shopping, etc., uh, the sort of drive till you qualify strategy that you're going to go farther and farther out until you can find a house that you can afford. So they're starting to look at housing and transportation costs together when determining affordability. Um, so now it's those spending more than 45% of their household income are uh, considered to be housing and transportation burdened. And again, the Bureau of Labor Statistics said that the average household spends roughly half of its income on housing and transportation combined. So a little more than what we should be spending, but not, not too far off. Um, so there's a tool called the Housing and Transportation Affordability Index. I'm not going to show any maps or anything tonight. We're just kind of giving the, the basic idea of what this index shows. Um, but according to this affordability index, one in six Durham households are cost burdened for housing alone. That's the 17% you see on there. Um, again, meaning that they spend 30% or more of their income on just housing. But when you include transportation costs, that number shoots up to more than three quarters of Durham households are housing and transportation burdened. Um, so when starting to look at affordable housing policies, you want to avoid taking people out of the yellow, out of the 17% and putting them into the blue 78% by you know, creating affordable housing way outside of town where maybe the land is cheaper, but you don't want to just switch people from category to category. Um, so to reiterate, um, this new manner of thinking, households are cost burdened if it's 45% or more of their household income spent on housing plus transportation costs. Um, the drive till you qualify strategy of finding affordable housing is problematic because living farther away from your daily needs, farther away from the urban center, drives up your transportation costs. Studies show that households living near transit have transportation costs up to 10% lower than households that live farther away from transit options. And again, looking at housing policy, you want to consider not only affordability of housing, but of transportation costs associated with that location. And you also want to try to craft incentives for creating affordable housing uh, in areas with affordable transportation costs. I think that wraps up our... Oh, I never mind that then. I have some reports. I don't know what the protocol is for um, passing out documents, but I have some. Yeah, you can, you can pass them out. Okay. Them. It's a report that uh, Triangle J and Triangle Transit wrote on uh, living, linking workforce housing and transit in the triangle. It has some nice maps and graphs. Okay. Thank you, Laurie. Yeah, I'm going to sum up with an all-important sum up slide. Can't get enough of those bullets, can you? <laughs> uh, median household income in station areas is significantly lower than is typical for Durham. Station areas exhibit higher rates of renter-occupied housing and vacancies. The vast majority of residential structures are of normal to fair condition with some variation from station area to station area. And transportation is a significant cost for Durham County residents and should be a factor in future housing policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> okay, this was not a public hearing, so do we have uh, comments? I got Mr. Whitley, Winders, Miller, his last name is Gibbs, Commissioner Gibbs. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Whitley. Um, thank you for your hard work in putting this together. But I'm a little curious because you now you um, you have lumped into uh, what you call housing um, all the homeowners and the rental property. And I'm thinking where you had the largest population. Start the clock. The largest population, you, um, it looked like there's a lot of housing, but that's not the, indeed the case. Um, we have probably have more in East Durham. We probably have more rental property than anywhere else in the city. You know, 
and it makes it weird because the next growth area for the city has to be East Durham. You know, you're just gonna run out of land in South, in South Durham and you don't have the transportation taking place in North Durham. So, and um, it, it, I would love to see a graph that shows home ownership so we can really see the problem. You know, and who has to be lo relocated and who, who doesn't. I, I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you again. Okay, that was not a question. Commissioner Winders? I wanted to ask Ms. Woods about, um, uh, I guess all of, all of this anal analysis is based on the census data that, that you gave, right? Most of it. Yeah. Is, do you have some sense, you know, in, in looking at the new development that's, that's um, happening downtown and, and uh, out uh, and towards Duke, the medical center and all that, you know, uh, all those units that are approved and I think probably most of them are under construction now, how does the number of new units coming online compare to the existing units? You know, like what's the percent growth that's going on there? Um, in the downtown tier, I think it's going to more than double the amount of housing. Yeah, and do you, um, what do you think the, demogra how do you think that's going to change the demographics? Do you have any sense from the type of, uh, uh, of, of development that's going up or the price of it, and, uh, I guess. We don't know what the rents are gonna be there. Uh, um, yes. Actually, probably you can use as a guideline for the rents some of the recent housing over the last five years that's mm -hmm. come in, or for instance, the existing structure, um, uh, pricing at say West Village. Um, for most of it, my suspicion is it's probably going to attract um, empty nesters who are in their 20s and have disposable income. Mm -hmm. So it's not gonna be those poor medical uh, students at, at Duke, it's gonna be new people that aren't living in the, in the area. Uh, they may be students, but I suspect poor might be a stretch. Yeah, <laughs> well I mean, you know, technically census poor. <laughs> um, and uh, then, I think that as with the goal of, of uh, and this could be a question for any of you that are working on this, <laughs> the, um, the, the goal of 15% uh, affordable housing um, is kind of diff what kind of measures are we gonna use or what data do we have to be able to tell whether we're um, uh, progressing towards that goal or not, you know, how can, um, or how can we say how many affordable houses do we, or much affordable housing do we need and, you know, in each state, in each area? Sure. We'd uh, take a, a try at that and Pat or Laura or, or Bergen uh, pile, pile on. The, uh, so w one of the uh, new features of MAP 21, the transportation bill under which we've applied for the Durham Orange Light Rail project for the first time asks to measure affordable housing in transit station areas. And so the federal government hasn't finalized exactly what they're looking for, but what they're looking for is um, some number of uh, rent or cost restricted units. They could be owner occupied or renter occupied. So something like a home trust or an affordable rental. Um, they're looking to see prior to the investment in transportation, what are the number of uh, income restricted units in the corridor and for how many years are they income restricted? Uh, mm -hmm. You would say a five-year income restricted unit is not as powerful an investment in affordable housing as a 20-year or a 99-year restricted unit. So they're going to ask us to count those up and what they're going to want to see is the project advances through phases of development. How is the community in the city um, increasing uh, the number of units and either you know, keeping to that 15% percentage or at least raising the percentage over what it was at the baseline. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how we'll measure. Um, how we will get on the strategies, I would yield to my colleague, uh, Pat, and let him yeah, talk about um, that. As needed. Pat Young again with the planning department. You're, you heard Mr. Medlin talk about the different components of the affordable housing uh, strategy, and one of the very preliminary pieces that we should have in the next several months here, uh, certainly by the end of the summer, 
is a session, and I think I mentioned this to you all before, that's going to look really in detail at some of this baseline data that Patrick's describing um, to try to talk about that, what the how, really just an expansion on the work that Patrick and his team did on the um, existing housing condition, existing affordability uh, information, and then looking at some of the new construction that um, Commissioner Winders and others have discussed um, and looking at essentially kind of the per unit subsidy necessary to make that type of construction affordable at, say, a, a couple of different station areas. Mm -hmm. um, one of the issues we're dealing with here um, is that the, each of the station areas have dr really dramatically different economics of land costs and other infrastructure conditions and other things. So we're going to try to create some of that differentiation and talk about it in detail. And I think that will create essentially a, ba a, a starting point for the conversation about what types of incentives uh, will work and are, and are necessary. Yeah. I don't know if that's helpful. So, but you're saying that it's not, we don't, we're not just, it's not going to be enough just to have units that are at a certain, to have rent at a certain level. We have to have some kind of formal to, to although our resolution and our goal doesn't really say, say that, but, but we, there was an understanding that it was uh, one of the major incentives for doing it was to improve the uh, rating on the, on the uh, rail, uh, proposal, but that uh, we, we have to have some kind of uh, legal restriction on it, and, and along with that would go some, kind, some mechanism for monitoring it uh, and, uh, you know, uh, for up approving the people who are uh, determining who's eligible and determining that the unit will still be affordable when that person moves on. Maybe that's not right. as much of an issue as so, for rental housing as it would be for. Right. So I, I, Patrick may be able to expand on this, but I, I think the FTA will allow us to look at both re, um, income restricted housing, that, like you're describing, that's under some kind of deed restriction or direct ownership of a public entity, and that's economically available. And I think we can get credit or consideration for, for both types. Um, Patrick, again, can speak to that. I, I um, think it, this, is, this is sort of where we're, we're walking a new road with the federal government together on this question. Um, I think, so interestingly, the map that's in the handout that Bergen just supplied for all of you, looking at the existing affordable units, if you take a look at that, the Durham Orange Light Rail Corridor is in there as one of the map segments. Um, I, when FTA asked, we, we, we said, well, what kind of materials would you like? And they said, well, send us what you have. And I have a feeling that they might open that you know, map and say to Seattle, hey, we, we really like Durham's map. Would you send us one of those? And they might like something from Seattle and say, hey, have you seen Seattle's data tables, will you send us one of those? So we're waiting to hear kind of as they develop their, this is the first time they've measured this. But I, I think what Pat is getting at is correct, that if we have sort of organically afford, like let's say we're building and permitting new units and they're coming in that somebody at 60% of the area median income can afford in the Dillard, Buchanan, which, whichever station area, we, we should get credit for that and we should be able to explain to them. Now the, the question they'll ask back to you is, well in five years will the rent be double? And that's where they'll be interested in the legal, the legally maintained, um, you know, affordability. And we'll we'll probably want to try to address both sides of that question. Bergeny, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, and he mentioned that the Triangle J is currently working on an inventory of affordable housing units in the Greater Triangle area, but Durham is definitely a priority. And the maps that are in um, the report that I handed out were as comprehensive as we could get them by the time we had to publish this, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a work <coughs> in progress, so we will have baseline data. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Miller. Bergen, if you come to the mic, I have some questions. I found your uh, presentation fascinating. Uh, do we know where the 78%, the 78% of the people of Durham who are housing plus transportation burden, where do they live? Um, if I recall, they're all over the place um, because there are, there are different elements at play there. So it's not, I mean, it, you can be not necessarily a low income person and still be housing uh, burden. Obviously. If, yeah, if you um, live in a very expensive house or drive, you know, two hours to get to your job, your transportation costs are going to be high. Um, but they really are all over the city. But I would encourage you to take a look at um, the index yourself, and you can see you can go as low down as uh, census tract and look at your own neighborhood or the city or the county as a whole. It's um, if you just Google housing and transportation affordability index. So are we planning to put transit where it will s 
serve these people the best? I mean, or are we mismatching it? Because um, that was, it seems to me that's where your presentation was heading, but we never got there. Are, in other words, are we going to put this light rail system where the 78% can use it? Well, as I said, the 78% are scattered all around the city. Um, and well, yes, the light rail. 78%, they'd have to be. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, I don't know that it's directed at that specifically, but yes, they would have access. Pat, did you have something to say to that? No, I, I just think if you look at that data, I mean, my conclusion was there's a, a, a set of people who are, in some sense, voluntarily have, have chosen to be meet, exceed that 50% criteria. Right. And there are people who are involuntarily because of lack of choices. Mm -hmm. And it's it's impo the data doesn't tell you what what that is, but that uh, pretty clearly appears to be the case. But and also you said that the average was fifty percent. You know, so so half the people are over over forty five percent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or more than half. Yeah. All that. Did you really mean average, or did you mean median, or something? You know? Well, that is the average. The average, and that one was American household because that came from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so. It's fascinating to me, uh, using the 9th Street example, which I'm very familiar with. So we have, as a result of the, uh, a combination of factors, but not the least of which is the, the, the rezoning that we took there to, to promote redevelopment of the area. Mm -hmm. We've got about 1,100 new housing units going in. The rents there, at least the ones that are published online, range from $1,100 for a studio apartment of a very few square feet up to about just under $4,000 for a three bedroom uh, unit. Uh, I don't know how many of those people would be in the 78%, but that's very high and, it, and we have no planned units that would meet any measure of affordability. Um, and all of this would be rental occupied. So it's, it's really interesting, and I think that one of the things that we need to do as we, as we plan for the next stations and the next uh, compact neighborhoods that we start working on is do a better job than we did in Ninth Street for making some sort of provision, whether it be incentive or some other mechanism, for providing for some housing where some of the 78% can go. Um, it, it, it worries me. Uh, I mean, it's, it's thrilling and exciting to see the, the redevelopment, but uh, it worries me. And, of course, the same thing is now happening in, I don't know whether it's the Buchanan or downtown area, but as we build more and more of these multifamily high-rent projects, and we've got them coming on all the time and read about them uh, every month in the newspaper. So can I, can I quickly comment on that? Um, I think we, we pretty clearly have three um, at least partially competing goals. Uh, we have a goal of creating high density, um, which is essential to the efficient um, operation of the transit system. We have a goal of affordable housing, which we've been talking about, and we have a goal of uh, new development re or redevelopment that um, is of substantial value so that um, it's of a scale that creates a number of jobs and that has a high tax value and therefore adds to the tax base. The, as I said, those goals are, are competing. So I think as we go into this process, we're going to try to talk about how those things play against each other and what the trade what the trade offs are, because that's really what we're talking about. Um, if we're going to get the high density and we're going to get the new development, there's probably going to have to be a higher per unit subsidy, and there's going to be more rental units. Um, if we're going to try to do more preservation <coughs> of existing stock, we can do that. That may take land out of, uh, of opportunity for inc increased density and increased value and in redevelopment. So th that's what this process is going to talk about are the, are the trade-offs. There, there's no way to get all three of those things the, at the levels we would, would want necessarily. Pat, if I could. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Uh, also respond to Mr. Miller's comment. I think one of the things that as we look at some other situations around the region where this is going on, um, Franklin Street in Chapel Hill is another pretty <coughs> expensive real estate market, would we agree? Um, the interesting thing that's going on on Rosemary Street right now is that there is a new uh, building being built called the Shortbread Lofts, which will be the newest, you know, student-oriented housing complex on the street. And the warehouse across the street is cut rent by $120 a month to deal with the competition of the new building. And so I think one of the questions in a place like 9th Street that's experiencing, and I 
uh, you know, I, your, your diagnostic of what's coming on is exactly what I've seen when I read those same websites and look at rents and things like that, is, is the competition that those new units are bringing into the pre-existing rental market, is it helping to slow the increase in rents at existing units? And is that helping with, I think it was these sort of more organically affordable stock by increasing the supply in the neighborhood. So I think one of the things that we can think about, and I think uh, you know, Pat Young is right when he says we want to talk to FTA about, yeah, we're trying to do uh, legally restricted units for f folks at certain income levels, but we're also trying to help you know, uh, perhaps moderate the rate at which rents increase so that the market has a larger organically affordable portion of the market that reaches folks at moderate and, and middle incomes. And so I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that question in 9th Street, but that, that's a data gap where if we could learn about some of the rents at the non-new properties, we might see if the new properties are helping the existing ones you know, remain affordable or uh, increase in rent more slowly. Because we're seeing that at least in one a couple places in Chapel Hill. Whether it will last, who knows. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm really impressed at the level of study and the level of understanding uh, that has been developed here as we go through this, because this is a huge public investment of, of money, and you want to make sure that it works. Uh, but I'm confident that to the extent that we can we can guarantee success through understanding that but that's being accomplished. So I'm really impressed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are there other comments? Okay. Yeah, Commissioner Davis, Smusky, and Winders. Um, I just had one question. I was looking at the information that said linking workforce housing and transit. Was there any look at, if we look at medium household income under 30,000, what location where they worked, such as maybe Duke and those areas, uh, to kind of see if we need to place it around those centers of where low income households are actually working uh, to kind of accommodate that? That would kind of leave some of that pressure of having to commute so much if they had affordable housing closer to the areas that they work? Was there any information that look at where these people were working that fit the demographics of low income? No, for this report we did not look at that. Um, that is a good thing to look at and I know that there are strategies um, to, and I think Duke even did one, didn't they? Trinity Heights or something like that is a um, little neighborhood that is specifically for Duke employees. But no, for this report, we didn't look at that. But um, maybe for a next a version two of this, that would be a good thing to look at. Commissioner Smusky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, most of the time when I go to Durham Open Space and Trails Commission on behalf of this board, I'm there to offer the, that board some information. This is an opportunity for me to bring some back to, to us. And that is there was a presentation at the last meeting about an alternative routing for this, for this proposal. And I didn't think much of it at the time because everything's going down a certain path. But it seems to me this data would make me want to take a second look at it because it goes from around Duke, and obviously this downtown corridor that you did the study on is, is a very important part of the whole transportation um, scenario that we need in this county. But it would go down 40 out into the park where, Mr. Davis, you were suggesting some of our folks might actually be working, take a turn at 40, come in across the southern part, down where there's commercial establishment, and come in the southern part of 54. But Mr. Smusky, I've seen that twice. They picked up at LaSalle Street. They didn't go all the way to Patterson Point to start. They picked up at LaSalle Street, and this is no. following the corridor. Well, they they need the be rail pick, corridor. They need to be picking up at at the station at least at the Patterson station, Point. At least at the station that we were talking about uh, in our studies here. But you you're right. Um, I think that these stations that we talked about should be included in that study, but maybe it's time that we reconsider that. But I think what I'm hearing from you is that it's already decided. <laughs> no. I, I can speak to it. We actually took a look at that corridor back in, I think, 2007 and 2008 through a process called the Special Transit Advisory Commission. What we did is we started off 
Oh, very sorry, sir. Um, you know, there's the mic. Okay, great. Um, back in 2008, we had a process where we went to the Metropolitan Planning Organization, Durham, Chapel Hill, Carborough, and also our colleagues in Raleigh and said, pick any major quarter that you guys are interested in for major transit investments. We, we established a list of 18 quarters throughout the region. And we went through and kind of looked at the trips per acre for jobs, generated by jobs in the quarter, housing in the quarter, and how that all interplays together. And the, I've seen that alternative presentation in the, that quarter that we looked at. Um, it was not one of the top performing quarters. The quarter that we have proposed and moved forward is, is basically the top performing quarter in the region. And the, the biggest challenge on the travel demand side from that presentation is that um, the going from Alston Avenue to the east and using that, or some are going through the research triangle, eastern research triangle, or western research triangle park area, is that the folks who live there do not have strong commuting, working, or recreational trip patterns in relationship to the big generators in downtown Durham and UNC, the way that the folks at Patterson Place and along MLK. The travel patterns are much more uh, richly interrelated in terms of where they work, where they shop. And um, when we did that analysis in 2008, we looked at that and we thought the best bang for the buck and, and we could sh forward that analysis to this group if it would be helpful. Um, but that, at that point, we, the MPO decided the quarter that we needed to focus on was the one between Durham and Chapel Hill. And that, that quarter may make a, an excellent future extension. Um, it's just in terms of where we see growth in Durham going and where this board and others have planned for future growth centers, that alternative proposal doesn't speak to the travel patterns that we have today and, and predict in the future in the same way that the proposal we're moving on does. Okay, and it doesn't have to go specifically there because I think it went farther out closer to 147 when Alston Avenue could be a, a good point to, to head south and that, that might be uh, something we want to look at. But it seems that if we go down the, the current plan that we're heading out into territory that's going to be developed and Mr. Whitley was talking about the need for development over on the eastern portion of Durham. And it, when we start developing out in the western portion of Durham, it's not going to be providing affordable housing. It's, it's going to be putting in, people in the place that um, Burgundy was talking about, about putting people out there where uh, they're, they're going to be outside of their transportation. Um, and, housing. I mean, the, the housing is going to be expensive when we start developing out there. So I think if, if you want to look at affordable housing, you want to include a plan and you, you want to do something that includes affordable housing, I think, I think we need to have, have more of a focus on the eastern part of Durham. But we definitely need to go to Duke. We need to start over on the far side of Duke over there. Thank you. I think Commissioner Wine knows who you were in the queue. I just uh, wanted to um, uh, mention that, that, uh, these, that the idea of the competing needs or competing goals shouldn't be overemphasized that they are, that affordable housing is complementary, not, you know, to economic development and to transit support because uh, having a mix of incomes everywhere, you know, it's the concentration of one kind of, of, in, of either high income or low income that uh, is detrimental to the, to the community in general in that um, it, um, if people can't live near where they work, not only are those people economically disadvantaged, but the employers are disadvantaged. And I think that, that um, Duke really, Duke understands that because they have been put a lot of investment into uh, uh, housing for, for uh, affordable housing, you know, in sort of in their, in their part of town. And uh, I think also, I think we have a policy about uh, concentration of too much affordable housing, but I think that, uh, and, the, and so we're sort of saying we want uh, mixed income housing, uh, which is beneficial to the schools. Uh, if you have, uh, I think Wake County has more of a problem with that than, than uh, Durham does, but you know, if, if, if you have this, these uh, uh, concentrations of high income and low income, 
it's, it's, uh, it hurts your school system. And so I just, I think that uh, the, uh, having mixed income housing is just a very necessary thing for the long-term uh, thriving of our, uh, for our com community to thrive, you know, in the long term. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Whitley. Yeah, hold on. You, were you looking for a response? Commissioner Winders. Uh, well, well I'll, I didn't, I'd like to know if there's any, uh, if, if, we, if we have any, could do any local data to sort of look at that about how does um, uh, the price affordability, affordable housing relate or when, the, or when these new, um, um, housing units come online, are they really going to generate more transit ridership or um, that I, I think there has been some research in other places that uh, car ownership actually went up in the, <laughs> in the uh, areas where this dense housing, housing was, uh, was built. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Winters, if I might quickly, I, I certainly didn't mean to say or imply there's a conflict between affordable housing and the com community goals that you stated. Everything you said is completely true. Um, what I was saying is, I think there's a, the, the, what I was trying to say is that um, because of the increase in land value associated with these significant transit investments, and because of the actions we're taking to encourage density in these areas, land values increase dramatically, and the market alone will not produce affordable housing, period. So we're gonna need to have significant regulatory and or direct financial interventions and participation to create the affordable housing, which has tremendous community ben benefits that you outlined, and that which is why we're talking about this subject and, and so concerned about it. Commissioner Whitley. Well, I, I've um, I've enjoyed the conversation, and um, I agree with most of what has been said, but I I want to talk about go back to this. What you know, I, I brought up the subject of rental versus homeowner. I live in, in a in East Durham. I live in a bedroom community. We go outside of our community for recreation, for um, for shopping, and and all the other needs that community have to have, and we come back. That means we take our wealth outside of our community. We don't have banks, we don't have doctor's offices, none of, none of that stuff that other neighborhoods and communities have. You know, and for when you have a high number of rental property, that's more wealth going somewhere else because the owner um, of the rental property lives somewhere else. You know, so we don't have a way like West Durham or South Durham have of keeping their money circulating in their own communities. And given that we're gonna have this big growth coming up because of transportation, it seems to me we will start thinking about how to make East Durham more stable. We're right next to the airport. You know, you got to go through East Durham to get there. The Research Triangle, same thing. You know, um, and I'm very proud of where I live. I love the people. But I know if we don't do the planning now, we're going to be in trouble later. You know, you only, right now you only have one stop. I know that's going to change. I just give me another minute. Okay. I know, I know that that's going to change when, when Raleigh come on board with, the, with their rail, rail design. You know, that you'll have more stops in Eastern Durham. Um, but we need to start thinking forward now. How do we keep wealth in our community? Larry, you <laughs> how do we keep wealth in our community? Interesting question, right? That's a big question. I'm, I'm not sure I could summarize in a few words. Mm. <laughs> well, I have one question. Neighborhood Improvement Services just introduced a new tool to look at demographics and look at communities. 
Are you familiar with it to pull some of the same information? And I think it's called Compass. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with it? I have not had an opportunity to look at it yet, but I have, yes, I am somewhat. Yeah, I, I haven't had an opportunity to look at it. Have you, Pat? I, I have, Commissioner Harris, that you're referring to. It's called the Neighborhood Compass. And yes. I, I would strongly recommend each uh, commissioner take a look at it. it. What it tries to do is really drill down on a wide variety, over two dozen uh, characteristics, uh, including uh, income, um, uh, proximity to transit, proximity to other amenities uh, at the neighborhood level. So it's, it's a tremendous tool, and it and it's de definitely can be a platform to talk about these issues and how they differ geographically across the okay. city. So I think, Melvin, that could probably benefit you, you know, in looking at East Durham and East Durham communities. I know I'm going to look at it for, for my neighborhood. So. so do we have any other questions of Laura and her team with reference to uh, the transit area, housing, housing stock? If not, this was just information for us, right? We don't, need, we don't need to take an action on it, right? The other thing we have is announcements, and I know Mr. Miller had an announcement, an item on the announcements. Tom? Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, members of the commission, I wanted to note uh, to you that uh, during April of this year, uh, the, in the General Assembly, the House Committee uh, on uh, Property Rights uh, heard a presentation uh, from uh, a, a person who's advocating the elimination of the protest petition right, which has been part of the fabric of our land use regulatory program in North Carolina since 1923. Uh, Legislation was introduced during 2013, uh, the long session of this General Assembly, to eliminate protest petitions. That uh, legislation did not pass. Uh, however, it was a very near-run thing. Uh, it's coming up. I suspect it will, based upon this presentation, which was actually an invited presentation, uh, based on this, I expect that it will come up again in this short session. And I hope that this body uh, if it doesn't, if it has an opportunity to, we'll be able to communicate to our elected officials, both in the city and county, so that they may communicate with our elected officials in the General Assembly uh, a strong stance against any legislation that would tamper with a citizen's right to file a protest petition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and I think we will all be in favor of that. Yes, Commissioner Whitley. Yes. Um, can you, um, Tom, can you send us some information so that we may at some point vote on it, on this? That would send a louder signal. As a new commission member, I'm not sure exactly what the protocol would be for a commission member initiated resolution, uh, but uh, oh, if the matter the hasn't time. been already determined by the time we meet in, no, in June, I can bring a resolution like that to you or even distribute it to you comfortably before I'm uh, the our meeting next month. Well, we we have done that um, <coughs> on several occasions, and I'm really thinking about July. The commissioner. I'm Young. afraid the short session may be over by then. Oh, commissioner Young, what's your recommendation? Short session. Yes. Yeah, so um, you you all certainly can take up and adopt any resolution that you see fit, um, and we'll, we'll assist you any way we can. I, I want to make sure that you understand that. Um, Mr. Miller could send out a resolution, but if there's a discussion about it over via email or more than uh, half of you, that, that would be a public meeting and we'd have to notice it. So I guess it's, if there's gonna be deliberation. I would probably send it to the staff so that it might be included in the agenda packet. Would that be satisfactory? That would be, a, that would be preferred. And then if there's any discussion, it just needs to be less than, and you all, you all can obviously discuss it at the June meeting. Yes, um, we can do I that. certainly share Mr. Miller's uh, observation that the, there's a good chance the short session will be over by the end of June. Uh, Supervisor Whiteman, what do we have for uh, June? I don't know if anyone's ever called me Supervisor Whiteman before, but um, I, we have one we have one case scheduled for next month, which is the revisit of the, the zoning case on Fayetteville Street from last month. Okay. And <clears throat> for the record, 
the meeting in June. I will be in Canada, so I will ask for an excuse absence for that particular meeting. <laughs> Commissioner I, I need to ask for an excu uh, 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 excused absence next month also. Okay. Uh, we'll pass those on to the chair. He okay. has the authority to grant those. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, are there other announcements from staff? Nope. Other comments from the commissioners? If not, I accept a motion for adjournment. It's been motion that we adjourn and so order. Thank you.